Notes for today's sermon are available by going to our website, CordealFirst.com. You can click on the Sermons tab, go down to today's date, and download the sermon notes as well as devotional readings for the coming week.
going on in the life of the church today. And that's absolutely marvelous. We want to begin, before we do anything else, with an ongoing celebration, as we've been doing, of our missions, of our outreach ministries. And in your bulletin, you'll see an insert about soul food. I mentioned that it's meeting this week. But I want to ask this morning if uh, Dale Steiner will come up. Dale has been the spearhead, uh, head taskmaster, um, um, guru, ask him all sorts of new um, you know. Uh, she is the one who's been the heart and soul of, of soul food here for a long time. And she's going to come and share with you a little about this ministry that you support that you may not be as familiar with. So Dale, if you'll come and share a little bit. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, if you know me, you know that I can talk about our award-winning food pantry ad nauseum. However, if you've read the Soul Food article in the newsletter, you know about the background and you know how I feel about why we do it. Um, there are a few things regarding the food pantry that you may not know, and I'm just going to hit on a couple of them. Uh, what do we give the people who come to us? Food and clothes, of course, uh, but also respect, the Word of God, music, fellowship, uh, time for testimonies, uh, baby blankets for the newborns, Christmas presents at Christmas, coats in the wintertime, anything we can do to help or receive need. Uh, and no one is turned away. Uh, how do we get the food? A lot of people have asked me that. Uh, Second Harvest of Georgia is a food bank that distributes food donated by retail food sources. Uh, in Southwest Georgia, the uh, warehouses are in Valdosta, Tifton, and Thomasville. Uh, we buy the food for approximately 19 cents a pound, and it's delivered once a month to our um, activity center. Uh, where and when do we use this food? On Tuesday before the third Thursday, you got that? <laughs> it's confusing to all of us. Um, we take the delivered food and we divide it on five or six tables in the activity center. Uh, we bag four or five items per double bag, who are double bag by our volunteers. Um, these bags are then placed in huge watermelon bins and we distribute from those bins on the Thursday following the Tuesday. Uh, several of the volunteers take food to shut-ins. Um, we are able to help noon and during the tornado time. We had food left over, and the reason we had leftovers is because Newton was going to need it. So we sent it to them. Um, nothing goes to waste. During the COVID period, we've been dis distributing from the carport, and we're going to keep doing that until we feel it's safe, but hopefully soon we can open back up. Finally, every, everything about the food pantry comes from the grace of God and you. Um, the money for the food, the food, the clothes, the bags, and the volunteers come, come from this congregation and other congregations in the community um, volunteer regularly at the food pantry. Uh, the money that you give every week to the church does not go to the food pantry. The money we get has, done, has been designated, if I can say it, specifically for uh, the food pantry. So if you make out a check and put food pantry in the memo, we get it. Okay? Then the last thing is if you have a couple hours to spare, one week a month, join us. If you know somebody who needs some food, we can help. If you have a, a heart for the less fortunate, join us. If you feel that you should be doing something for the Lord, join us. If you're a farmer and have surplus produce sometimes, donate it. If you're decluttering, think of us. Um, there are many ways to be part of this mission. You can just ask me, I'll tell you. Uh, the mission has been mightily blessed by God, and you will be blessed too if you join us. Um, this is Food Pantry Week, so come and see what's going on. Thank you. If you've not been down here when, when Soul Food is running, um, you know, we generally, even now under COVID, as, as Dale mentioned, we've been having to just deliver them to cars, but we end up with cars out in the lot and into the street. Uh, crowds of folks come. When we were meeting in-house, we filled that activity center with folks as they come in. Uh, 
uh, it's a wonderful and marvelous ministry. And I want to uh, illustrate one thing that Dale mentioned. Uh, we had one month where we didn't have as many people coming through a lot of different circumstances. There was rain, there were other things. So we had a bunch of leftover food. And that happened to be the week when the tornadoes hit Noonan. And we had a wonderful opportunity of somebody calling and saying, hey, do we have any, maybe a few canned goods because we're going to bring them up there. It's like, well, funny you should ask. We've got an entire room full of food. And so it was able to go up and load trucks. It's a bigger ministry than just handing out a few canned goods over in the activity center. And that's part of your ministry as a church. As Dale mentioned, if you give special to that, it goes to that. What you put in the plate keeps the lights and the air conditioning on and runs the facilities. But those missions are those places where God's put it on your heart to go a little above and beyond. And we encourage you to do that. As we've been doing throughout this year, reminding ourselves to refocus and pay attention to our call to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the outermost parts of the world. And this is our Jerusalem. And so I encourage you to keep that ministry in your prayers uh, and in your, your hands as you serve it. Today is also a special day, as you may have noticed, as we take a moment to honor our seniors who are graduating and heading on to the next big thing in their lives. And one of the things I love about Senior Day and this moment to celebrate is that we celebrate not just this day or this time of graduation, but the fact that with, in many cases we've had the wonderful opportunity to see these folks grow up and have, have gone through the church. And so with that in mind, as well as an opportunity to embarrass them terribly, would you pay attention to the screens on either side for just a moment?
church that we promise to be there for each other from the time they're small to the time they're grown, even when they head off uh, after graduation. And so it's a celebration of this life that we're given to share together. I want to take a few moments and uh, lift these graduates up in prayer. They're going on to school and to jobs and to other occupations, but they will always and everywhere be a part of the Cordial family. And so we want to take a moment and pray for them, give thanks for them. Uh, and so if the seniors, if y'all would stand up, please. And we're all, turn around and face them. There you go. And if you would, bow your heads and let's have a word of prayer this time. Almighty God, we thank you that you are faithful. We thank you that you move in our lives in profound ways. And Lord, on this day especially, we give thanks for these seniors. Lord, we thank you for the fine young men and women they've become. We thank you for the exciting futures you have in store for them. We thank you for the church that has surrounded them and nurtured them. And Lord, we thank you for the ways you will be with them in all that comes after this moment. Lord, as they move into new places in their lives, continue to give them strength. Continue to move with them and through them. Lord, continue to give them direction. Lord, be with their families as they adjust to this new step. Be with all of us as we seek to serve you in all times and places. For Lord, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for the blessings you pour out in the forms of people we love and the gifts that you give us. We give you thanks for your abiding presence and enduring strength. Lord, we give you thanks and honor and celebration on this day as we celebrate this graduation. But more than that, Lord, as we give thanks for the life you give us in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, go with each one of us. Teach us to follow in your footsteps, to bear witness to your love, to share with all the world the amazing gift we've been given in you. In short, Lord, make each and every one of us disciples of Jesus Christ, who walk in a way that leads to life, and who pray together the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's give a round of applause for our class.
Our scripture lesson this morning comes from Paul's letter to the church at Colossae. We're in Colossians chapter 3. We'll be reading that one in just a minute. We continue our series on spiritual disciplines, what we call pump you up, that idea of, of growing in strength and developing uh, our process of, of, of following the Lord. And remembering that when we become disciples of Jesus Christ, it's not something that just happens magically. We are called to walk with Him and grow with Him. And we're going to kind of continue to play with that a little bit this morning. But I want to give you an image first, and it kind of made me think about it here uh, with our, our senior slideshow. Uh, I, of course, I didn't do slideshows when I was a senior. It was a little more complicated than that. But I remember when my kids came through, and we watched those, and then my wife cried, and it was exciting in those moments. Those snapshots of life at that time. And it got me thinking about my own high school days, and I, as I was in the process of putting the sermon here together, it got me remembering a couple of guys in my high school class, and I was, we'll call them Lee and Tommy, okay? And, and Lee and Tommy were, were, were an interesting pair, and walk with me here a bit. Uh, they were both on the football team. They both played offensive line on the football team. They're both really good guys. They're good friends of mine along the way. But they couldn't. And that's where the similarities ended. They were incredibly different people. Lee was one of those guys who was a talker. Lee would tell you everything about the game and about the team. Lee could, could, could get everybody fired up in the locker room. Lee, Lee just was, was all profound talk. I mean, he was always there on those. Tommy Barely said a word. If, if you got a hello out of Tommy, you were doing too shy and quiet. And, and you know, that was, was pretty typical of Tommy. If you were to meet them uh, after a game one day, after one of the football games, Lee would tell you all about the game. He'd tell you about every play. He'd tell you about the, the difficult parts, the triumph, the wonderful part. He would just go on and on and on about the game. And he knew everything that had happened. If you ran into Tommy after the game, Again, you might get one word, but you would notice a profound difference other than just how much they shared. You see, if you ran into Tommy, Tommy was likely to be covered in mud and grass stains and dirt. Nine times out of ten, he was bruised and scraped and had a bandage of some sort over top of him. If you ran into Lee after the game, and if you were able to get a word in edgewise, you might ask him, your jersey is suspiciously clean. Now, I share that with you because there's a reason that Lee's jersey was suspiciously clean. You see, my high school was a big high school, and we had a big football team, and we, we, we won lots of games. And the general rule of thumb was, if you tried out for the football team, you would make the football team. You would play, but you would make the football team. And anybody was welcome on the sidelines. And if you look down on our team when they were playing down there, there would be a whole sea of guys in red and white jerseys who never once went on the field. And all of those jerseys were marvelously clean. And I think you can guess where Lee stood during that period. As a matter of fact, I don't think I ever saw Lee ever on the football field. Tommy, on the other hand, played first string from the time he was a freshman. And Tommy wore it out on that field. Now, here's why I'm telling you this story. Not to, to, to denigrate Lee or to make it look any better, but there's a difference between talking about it and there's a difference between doing it. Lee could tell you an awful lot about the game, but you'd have some suspicions if you realized that he'd never actually played a game. Tommy didn't have to tell you anything. His entire being told you about his dedication to that team. I want you to keep that image in your head as we share a little bit this morning. Now, we've been talking about spiritual disciplines. For those who have not been with us, just to get you up to speed, a spiritual discipline are just those practices that we engage in. There are exercises that we follow through to make us grow in our faith, to get us stronger. They're like drills or, or practices. They're, they're designed to increase how we serve. And we've talked about a few of them along the way. For example, prayer and Bible study. In doing those, knowledge becomes stronger in us. We get to understand what it's about. We begin asking questions. We grow mentally. Prayer helps us grow spiritually, learning to rely on God. And I don't mean just occasionally tossing up a prayer before dinner. I mean a disciplined, focused prayer life, just like a disciplined regimen of exercise. We've talked about Sabbath keeping and about being in community and fellowship together. And those are disciplines that develop a certain rhythm in our lives. They keep 
our pace and they mark how we live and how we move forward. Today I want to talk about another set of disciplines. They all kind of overlap. All of these are practices we engage in. But I want to talk a little about the disciplines of generosity and of service. And they may not think of those as disciplines. We all try to be generous. We all try to be of service. But when we're dealing with the Christian walk, we need to recognize that generosity, living a life that is poured out, and service, working for others, is the little core of the scriptures. You can read through all the Bible and you will find wherever you run into this idea of giving our all, this idea of being generous to those less fortunate, this idea of serving others is paramount to the Christian faith. And it's something we have to practice and we're going to explore that just a little bit this morning. So kind of keep those in your mind. And we're going to jump into Colossians chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. And then I'll skip down and read at verse 23. Now this is a scripture about a perspective. It's about setting an attitude and keeping in mind why we're called to do what we're called to do. Would you hear the word of the Lord again from Colossians chapter 3? Each one of you, that's speaking to the church of Colossae and speaking to you and me, each one of you is a part of the body of Christ. And you were chosen to live together in peace. So let the peace that comes from Christ control your thoughts and be grateful. Let the message about Christ completely fill your lives while you use all your wisdom to teach and instruct each other. With thankful hearts, sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God. Whatever you say or do should be done in the name of the Lord Jesus as you give thanks to God the Father because of Him. And skipping down to verse 23. Do your work willingly as though you were serving the Lord himself, not just your earthly master. In fact, the Lord Christ is the one you are really serving, and you know that he will reward you. This is the word of God for the people of God. May our thanks be to God. So let's jump right into this and kind of explore what it means to live generous lives, what it means to live lives focused in service, how that's a discipline of discipleship. As always, I remind you, you've got the notes here, well, if you can follow along as we talk this morning. There are also daily devotions if you want to read up and kind of develop deeper into this. And if you go online, you can download a small group devotional guide if you work with others and you can take this a little deeper. Again, this is designed to get us started at working at it, not just kind of passing through. So I encourage you to take that a little bit deeper. But let's begin with note number one. Living generously is an act of worship. Stop there. Living generously is an act of worship. Now remember, we've talked about this before. Worship comes from old Anglo-Saxon word, and it literally means worship, that which is worthy. And it, it follows a truth that you know long outside of theological circles. That which is primary in your life, that which you put first, that which is worthy to you, has no other choice but to shape you. Okay? Think about it this way. If you pour heart and soul into your work at the exclusion of all else, at the exclusion of family, at the exclusion of other goals, if you just pour yourself into your career, odds are you will become very, very good at your career. You'll likely lose everything else. But what is worth it to you shapes who you are. And that's just true in all sorts of things, in all sorts of ways we live in things. And so this idea of living generously as an act of worship reminds us that what we value, what we put first in our lives, shapes us. We are shaped by whatever or whoever we think is worthy and that we put our efforts into. And if that's Christ, then that shapes us perfectly. If it's not Christ... We're going to be shaped by it. There's a wonderful line in Romans 12 that I love where Paul says, Live lives, present your, your bodies excuse me, as a holy and living sacrifice. Remember, holy means separate. Present yourselves as a holy and living sacrifice, which is your spiritual worship. It's Romans 12, 1. It's a wonderful reminder, isn't it, that our lives are going to be offered to God as our form. Of worship. And I don't mean just the worship service. I don't mean just the little time we spend in the church. It's an attitude that we live in, and it's an important one we grab. In verse 17 of the Colossians passage we read, I love it. It says, Whatever you do, I love it, whatever you do, and whatever you say, you do it to Jesus. 
That's worship. That's putting everything first and foremost. And, and I want to share with you a story that, that was where I learned that lesson the hardest. Now, I, may, I know I've shared this with some folks, and I share this story a lot because it's one of those pivotal moments in my own spiritual journey. So if you've heard it before, just suck it up and deal with it. Uh, because I really want to share this with you. When I was a senior and, and graduated and went off to college, it was an amazing moment. I, I wore the funky hat. I got the, the diploma. I wore the robe. I went off to college. And it's amazing. I became brilliant. I went off to college and I instantly knew everything. I mean, I knew everything. My parents conversely became intentionally stupid. It was amazing. And I went off to college. And when I went off to college, I learned things and I became just the font of all knowledge, wisdom, brilliance. I was just, I'm incredible now. It was an amazing thing. Y'all should see. I just knew everything. And I was as arrogant as you can possibly imagine. Matter of fact, when I came home that first time, I got back, and it was amazing to me how stupid everyone had become. <laughs> My parents were so polite and idiotic, and I just had to put up with them because they knew nothing. And I went to people that I had known as adults, and I realized how far beneath me they were. And they just were not good enough for me. And then I went to church. And oh, did I find so many stupid, benighted people in church. I've been there all my life, you know, but they were now so incredibly stupid. They knew nothing. And I sat there in the church, and I sat with my arms folded with all the cynicism that is a brilliant 18-year-old can muster. And I sat there, and I watched the congregation, and I thought, choir sounds terrible. The bases are flat. The sopranos shouldn't even bother. And then I sat there and I thought, the sermon, oh, it's so boring. It's so elementary and childish. I'm getting nothing from this today. I'm sorry, Phil, I knew it was an English accent. <laughs> And he just, 
off the couch. And I turned around and there was my son, airborne. And I remember thinking, I've never been good at catching. He's going to die. But I will catch him. And I grab him in and I pull it. My heart's going 100 miles an hour. But I tell you that story because you know what? When he jumped off the couch, he had absolutely no doubt that dad was going to catch him. Because dad was dad. Now, we are all flawed people. The truth is, I could well have dropped him. But that image of absolute trust is the one we need to recognize. We're called literally to fling ourselves off the couch to God and say, Dad, knowing absolutely that he's got us in the palm of his hands. And we live generously, giving ourselves because we know that God's going to take care of us, that God's going to be there for us. By the way, that's the heart of giving when it comes to church, whether it's in service, whether it's financially. It's a, it's a sermon for another time, but it's the heart of that thing we call the tithe, that 10% giving that's put in the scriptures. Do understand something. God does not care about your money. He doesn't need it. Any more than God needed the, the bulls and the calves and whatever else they sacrificed on the temple in ancient times. God didn't eat the food that was put up there on the altar. You know why it was done? For the people. It was to give them an opportunity to express their trust and to experience God catching them. You gave the first 10% of your first fruits because you were trusting that God was going to be there for you later on. You poured yourself into it because you knew that God was going to catch you. So often we don't live generous lives because we don't trust God. We trust our ability to <laughs> We trust our vision, we trust our hands, our brilliance, our thoughts, and we forget that we're called to trust God. It's the idea that we live in that faithfulness. Jesus put it even better, obviously, in Luke 6, 38, he says this, I love it. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. In other words, he said that truth that we all know. If you give generously, you'll receive generously. Now, let me make a caveat here. I do not preach the prosperity gospel. This doesn't mean that if you give generously, that tomorrow there's going to be an awkward world and publishers clearing out sweepstakes and show up with a giant check and a bunch of balloons. That's not how it works. It's the call that when we give generously, God gives us what we need. God supports us in amazing ways. Things you didn't even know you needed, God is going to be there. And I always use this as an example. If you're always, if you wonder about tithing, and just use that one. And by the way, Jesus spends more time talking about money than about just anything else in the Bible. And you know why? Because that's where the rubber meets the road. We can talk a real good talk about following Jesus until it starts to hurt our pocketbooks. Until, until it starts to cause us to change how we live. And that's why it's there. So I've always told folks, if you're wondering about giving like that, if you're wondering about tithing, ask somebody who tithes. Because you know what I've encountered? I have never, ever, ever encountered somebody who faithfully gives, generously tithes, who regrets it. <clears throat> ever. Now, they don't come back going, I know, I want a million dollars. They make a mess, you know, I had to change my life. I had to adjust things. And I found it worked better. I trusted God. And he caught me. That's a spiritual discipline. And it's not just money, it's our talents, it's our service, it's our time. How generous we are reflects how much we trust God. The second thing, living generously, as an act of worship declares, is what we truly value. What we put our time and talents and efforts into. And the more we put in, in generosity, the more we put in, in terms of service, it shows the things that we really value and has an impact. There's an old folk tale, and I don't know, I've heard it attributed to Africa, I've heard it attributed to Indonesia, I don't know, but you probably heard it. I'll, I'll put it in Africa just for the fun of it. Uh, but the story is told of a village and a young man who wanted to, to, to marry a young woman in the next village over, and he went over, and the usual dowry price of those days, was usually considered about two cows. You know, if, if, if she was real plain, a cow. If she was okay and normal, two cows. If she was really good, three cows. And that was considered a good dowry uh, for that. The story was told of a young man who wanted to marry this girl in the village, and he went and he offered the father ten cows. Five times the going value. Of course, the father, being a wise man, said, absolutely, you got her, she's yours. And took the ten cows. But word got around to the other villages that over this village, there was a ten-cow woman. It was a woman worth ten cows, five times the way And people began talking, as people will do. She must be beautiful. She must be brilliant. She must be amazing. 
ten cows. He put quite a sizable investment into that, that young lady. And so he treated her like she was beautiful and like she was brilliant, like she was worth ten cows. He made a big investment. And people would come from miles around to see this ten cow woman. You know what they found? Found a ten cow woman who was honored and loved and lifted up, who was treated as valuable and priceless. You see, how we treat things shows what we value. One of the greatest challenges, you've heard me say it before, one of the greatest challenges I believe for the modern American church today is we all want Walmart Christianity. I don't mean to knock Walmart on that. When I say Walmart Christianity, I mean simply we want to get the most stuff for the least amount of money. We want to get all the services, all the fun, all the great stuff, all this, and we want to put as little in it as we possibly can. But you know what? If you go pay a goat instead of 10 cows, you know what you're going to get? You're going to get a goat one. What you're going to get is a faith that looks cheap, because to you it is cheap. What is it worth to you? We talk an awful lot about what are our children and our youth worth to us? Does it show? What are our worship services worth to us? What is our mission life worth to us? What is our outreach worth to us? And we can, in our clean jersey, say it means the world to us. And the world says, yeah, well, why is your shirt so clean? Where are your bruises? Where is your commitment? Where have you put yourself fully into it? Jesus again put it more simply in Matthew 6, 21. Where your treasure is, there is your heart also. What you put into it is what matters. The third thing that understanding generosity as worship uh, declares is it declares the reality of Christ in our hearts. It declares what we, where Christ is working in us and what he's doing. In verse 15, we began this passage this morning. It said, each one of you is part of the body of Christ. Now, we use that phrase, body of Christ, and it almost becomes so metaphoric that it just sounds abstract. But it literally means that. Each one of us is part of the body of Christ. You are all eyes and fingers and noses and hands. And Paul reminded us, don't be thinking that one part's more important than the other. Without all of us, we are diminished. This is a valuable part of who we are. But it's even deeper than that. You are the only Jesus many people will ever see. How you love, how you serve, how you care, how you commit to pouring yourself out for Jesus says to the world who Jesus is to you. And it says to the world whether or not Jesus is actually working in your hearts. Lee can talk an awful lot about the football game. But when you noticed that his jersey wasn't dirty and you saw Tommy, you said, what do you know of it? When have you ever been hit? When have you ever been out on the field? When have you ever done anything? And I'm afraid so many people look at so many in the church today who talk of love and grace and service and talk of the power of God and nothing in our presentation proclaims that. When we're more important worried about our jobs or whether we're money or worried about our own control, call for discipleship calls us to more than that. And that's where we move to the third note, or the second, excuse me. True lives of service and generosity. And I'm going to share three things they do for us. When we live with that, uh, that concept, that idea of living generously, true lives of service and generosity, number one, go beyond where we are comfortable. If you're going to live generous, you're going to go where it's uncomfortable. If you're going to live a life that serves, you're going to go where it's uncomfortable. Lee, I don't think, ever broke a sweat in four years of playing high school football. But if you really play, you know you're going to sweat. You're going to hurt. You're going to get into it. And, and I use the football metaphor. It works if you play music. If you don't get out there working, when I learned to play the guitar, and I still don't play it very well, but when I learned to play the guitar, I had the calluses on my fingers so that I would end up being able to hold the strings down. And it hurt, and it took a while. But until you get those calluses, you can't do much of anything. True lives of service and generosity go beyond the comfort. Verse 24 reminds us, do your work willingly. There's work involved. There's a commitment involved. There's a pouring out of ourselves involved in this. And I'm always reminded that the most profound moment of that is in Acts chapter 5. It's one of those horrible stories I think in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 5, we're introduced to a couple by the name of Ananias and Sapphira. Now, they looked and saw another member of the church, a guy by the name of Barnabas. Barnabas is a big name, means son of encouragement. Barnabas was the guy who, who just served and was loved, and everybody respected him, and he was marvelous. And Ananias and Sapphira wanted a piece of that. 
And so they went out and sold a piece of property, but they wanted to make sure they weren't uncomfortable, so they kept a little bit back, and they went to, to Peter and said, here's, here's the property, here's the money we sold. And Peter asked the question, he says, is, is this all of it? He said, yep, that's all of it. And Peter said, why did you lie? Now, what gets folks is in the story, at that point, God strikes Ananias dead. And then Sapphira comes in, she lies, and God strikes her dead. Best stewardship sermon ever. <laughs> but seriously, it's not about that. Seriously, the story is where Peter says, why did you lie? You didn't have to give it. You didn't even have to, to, to give all. You could have given some and said, we kept some back. The problem was that what she wanted was all the accolades and all the pride and all the whatever I think you wanted. She talked the talk. You didn't want to walk the walk. And of course, in the illustration, it's to remind us that God is deadly serious about whether we will or whether we won't. It's important that Jesus is very quick. He who puts his hand on the plow and goes back is not fit for the kingdom of God. In other words, if you're so busy worried about handling your own life and not trusting God, you're going to miss it. And the truth is, we are called to go beyond where we're comfortable and trust that God will have it handled. The second one, two lives of service and generosity, cause us to see from a more Christ-like vantage point. The more generous we are, the more we're following God's example. The more we serve, the more we're following God's example. We're stepping into his shoes and seeing the world from the one who took off his outer robe and washed his disciples' feet. As a matter of fact, one of the things we like to do is pull the story of Jesus out of the Bible. We like Jesus and the children. We like Jesus and the sheep. We like, the, we like him doing miracles and feeding folks. We like him healing people. We, we, we like the, the, the wonderful lessons and stories he teaches. We even like, in a horrible way, the drama of the cross and the celebration of the tomb. And all of those are marvelous. But you've got to put the whole story together. And the whole story has a common thread. For God so loved the world that he looked down on the broken mess it had become. He looked down on the people that he loved and had created, who had chosen to go every way with his way, who were busy tearing each other apart and were lost and hurt, and God said, I am going to do something about it. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And Christ came and he gave his heart and his love. He gave his wisdom and his guidance. He gave his flesh and his blood. He gave his life that we might have life abundant. Generosity and service are not just good ideas. They are the very footsteps of Christ. And the only way we have to walk and begin seeing from that perspective is what he really means by if you would be my disciple. Take up your cross and follow me. And last but not least is an important reminder. True lives of generosity and service change us. If we're not taking care of ourselves and we're learning to trust God, we change. When we depend more on Him and follow His way, we change. When we stop worrying about whether our jersey is clean and we roll up our sleeves and we jump into it with everything we are and follow with all that we can be and trust Him in our failings as well as our successes, trust Him in His infinite love even in our infinite failures and to know that He holds us in the palm of His hand only then are we walking in his footsteps? And only that way do we begin to change and become ever more new creatures to Christ who bear witness to his almighty power and his everlasting love with everything we say and everything we do. That, brothers and sisters, is what it means to be a disciple. It's what it means to grow in the faith. It's what it means to be a witness to the love, power, and presence of Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning uh, is hymn number 433, All Who Love and Serve Your City. And we're going to sing just verses 1, 3, and 5. Would you stand as we sing together?